All right, you're good to go. You're good to go. Yeah. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Janet Holm. I'm the interim, interim I can't even say that, interim dean of University Libraries. It's a pleasure to welcome everyone to our second presentation of the Fall 2023 Graduate Research Series, which is collaboratively hosted by University Libraries, the Graduate Student Senate, and Faculty Senate. The series supports the research process of graduate students through the sharing of their successes, challenges, and their use of information resources in a public forum. The presenters for the series are selected by the Graduate Research Committee, which is composed of librarians and staff from university libraries, as well as members from the Graduate Student Senate. This afternoon's presentation is with Yan Shu Moon and Agam Shahyal, both of whom are second year doctoral students in Instructional Technology from the Patton College of Education. Their presentation, Enhancing Interactivity in Asynchronous Online Teacher Preparation Courses, a Design-Based Research Approach, addresses the challenges of online learning and interactivity in online education. Tian Xu holds a bachelor's degree in English Language Education and a master's degree in TESOL, teaching English to speakers of other languages. Her research interests are in technology integration in education, online learning, teacher education, and computer-assisted language learning. Agam holds a bachelor's degree in English language teaching from Fatia Wakana Christian University in Central Java and a master's degree in Asian studies with a focus on modern history of Indonesia. Before coming to Ohio University, he taught the Indonesian language at Columbia University and at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His other areas of interest include foreign language pedagogy and second language acquisition. Please help me in giving a warm welcome to Helen Chu and Adam. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending this presentation. So. This presentation is our ongoing project, actually. So this project is entitled Enhancing Interactivity in Asynchronous Online Teacher Preparation Courses. So we've been working on this project since last spring. So we had multiple iterations of the designs that we are conducting this project. And a little bit overview about this project. Basically, we you know, created the design of an asynchronous online lesson in the teacher preparation course, and then we implemented that design, and then we use uh, the evaluations from the students to revise our design. So that's the iterative development of the design. So in the next 30 to 40 minutes, we'll talk more about that. So I hope you stay tuned with us, all right? Mm -hmm. So. This is the content of our presentation. This is how we organize our presentation. The first one, we are going to talk about online learning. We are going to define what online learning is, what are the types of online learning, and what are challenges of asynchronous online learning, since that's our focus for our project. And then the second one, since we know that there are challenges in asynchronous online learning, we would like to you know, meet that challenges. We would like to face the problems and give solutions. That's why we're focusing on design-based research. We are going to talk about what is design-based research and why our study is a design-based research. We would like to talk about our research questions, questions that guide us through this research project, and then theoretical framework that facilitated us in designing this educational intervention. We also are going to talk about uh, the first and second iterations of this research. And last but not least, we are going to talk about how we utilize the library resources so that it can facilitate our uh, research process. So, all right. So, online learning. I believe everyone has some kind of idea about online learning to some degree, especially with the COVID pandemic the popularity of online learning is, you know, it's increasing, it's prevalent now. So online learning is a type of learning where it's mediated by computer and internet connection. And this allows, you know, access to course remotely. Wherever you are, you can access the course material through the use of digital technology. And this type of learning provides flexibility 
and global connectivity so you can get connected with people beyond your area region or even country so that's one of the affordances and there are two types of online learnings as we know it the first one is the synchronous online learning so the characteristic is that this type of online learning is real time and then there is interactive instruction and the real timeness and the interactivity is usually mediated by some type of video conferencing tools as we are familiar with it teams zoom so that enabled that degree of interactivity and then the students and the instructors engage simultaneously through that digital technology and this type of learning promote live communications and engagement so that's what's so good about synchronous online learning the other type of online learning is asynchronous online and that's the focus of our research project so on the opposite of the synchronous online this type of learning asynchronous online happens at different times rather than real time so uh, usually happens throughout the learning management system where students can access at their you know, convenience. That's why it happens at different times. And this type of learning allows flexibility, which can cater to diverse schedules and time zones. Because you know, when we are registered to asynchronous online learning, we can access the course. You know, whenever we are you know convenient whenever we feel like we want to access the material as long as we are thinking about the deadline on the back of our head as long as you know we know the deadline we can pace our own study which which leads to promoting self-paced learning and also it's delivered through learning management system and instructor usually uses pre-recorded lectures discussion boards or like interactive uh, video viewing and those uh, those are the things that happen in the asynchronous online. However, this type of online can pose challenges and that will be explained by my colleague Hyunju. So among these two types of online courses, definitely asynchronous online course is more challenging by its nature. So that is why instructional design in this format is very important. Uh, I'm going to talk about like three challenges we paid attention. First of all, many students struggle uh, in asynchronous course because there is a lack of interaction. Uh, it's different learning environment compared to a face to face or a synchronous online course because there there is a physical distance. Like they get, do they have no chance to see each other? They they are not really peers in in the same spot, and also they can, cannot see their instructor, so they can feel isolated and lonely in their learning journey. So lack of interaction can be um, a hindrance in their learning journey. And also, since there is no immediate response from the instructor. Clear instruction is very crucial. However, in many cases, there are not really many unclear. There are not really many clear instruction is provided. That's why students are struggling in this kind of courses. And also students often feel like um, they are not really cared by their instructors and they are not really highly motivated <clears throat> in their learning journey. They are not really, uh, they do not know they are in the right track or not. They feel lost. So lack of engagement is also another challenge in this type of online courses. All right. So reflecting on those challenges of asynchronous online learning and, you know, as an instructors, we want to keep improving the practice of our teaching. So looking at these challenges, we want to provide solutions. We want to face that challenges, meet that challenges. And we are thinking using, you know, like to conduct research that can help us provide solutions to those challenges, which is a design-based research. So I would like to define first, what is design-based research? First of all, Design-based research requires iterative development of solutions to practical educational problems. And through the design, we aim to solve that problem, to face that challenges. And 
we want to provide solutions which can be educational products, processes, programs, or policies. And throughout this process as well, we want to discover new knowledge and we want to inform other practitioner, other teachers, other instructional designer, you know, like this new knowledge that can be helpful in designing asynchronous online instruction, for example. And the other thing that we would like to talk about is why our study is design-based research. Because first, looking at the challenges, we want to keep improving our practice and we want to provide solutions to practical educational problems. And then we have the product that we designed throughout this project. The design is the asynchronous online lesson that we have uh, tested out. And then we would love to share the new, knowledge, the new knowledge that we have gained from these research projects with other practitioners, scholars, or instructional designers. And as you see on the, it's still on the same slide on the that side. So that's the procedure that we followed when we um, conducted this type of research. We start with analysis and then go on with the design and then implementation, evaluations, reflections, and then going back to the analysis for the second cycle. So looking at the reflection, what can we do better in the second cycle? And I would like to explain further on the next slide of each of the steps in design-based research. So we started with analysis first. So we want to identify the problem first. What, the, what seems to be the problem in this type of online course? And then we review the relevant literature, like the theoretical framework that can help us understand the problem, or that can help us design this educational intervention. So problem analysis is conducted, we did that. And then after that, we proceed to the next stage, which is the design stage. You know, me and Hyunju work together. We, after understanding the problem, we propose our design idea to each other, you know, and then we talk about it, we discuss, collaborate, and then until we reach out, you know, agreement that the design is finally developed to address that problem. So after that, we implemented that design in the context, in the research context. And after that, we proceed to the next stage, which is the evaluations. We use um, open-ended survey to get evaluations from the students, inquiring their experience of taking that online courses. So that results of the evaluations is our, you know, input when we reflected and we analyze again on what can be improved. So that proceeds to the next cycle. After we learn, we implement it and then go on to the next cycle with a new revised design. This is our research questions that guide us through our research project. The first one concerns with the design itself. So when we design our uh, intervention, educational intervention, we think of how to enhance interactivity in the asynchronous online course. Like that's what we keep in mind, how to do it, how to enhance this interactivity. And then the second one, we want to know students' experience because this is the heart of design-based research, like, you know, the experience of the user or the students in this case. So this research question guide us, how do students experience the asynchronous online course designed to enhance interactivity and engagement? So these two questions guide us throughout this uh, design-based research project. And this is the theoretical framework that, you know, we use to guide the design of the lesson itself. So we use community of inquiry framework developed by Garrison 2009. Basically, this framework is a useful framework that can help us build and evaluate online learning environments. So this framework focuses on fostering engagement, collaborations, and critical thinking among learners. So these goals like fostering engagement, collaboration, critical thinking will be achieved through three subcomponents of this community of inquiry uh, framework. For example, cognitive presence, the process of constructing meaning to critical thinking and reflection. So when we build courses, we should reflect and consider whether we want to or we should 
uh, allow the opportunity for students to do some reflection, self-reflection, critical thinking activity, whether we have incorporated those aspects in our design, in, in the design of the uh, asynchronous online course. And then the second one is the social press. So it concerns with whether or not we have used or we have facilitated activity that can, you know, create like a social interactions among peers, within peer, uh, among students and the materials, whether they build some kind of sense of community. So as a course designer, that what we should consider as well, what we should keep in mind when building um, online courses or online learning environment. The last one, teaching presence. As my colleague explained earlier that asynchronous online teaching can be a lonely experience. So the teaching presence or the teacher presence is a very important aspect and that's delivered through clear self-explanatory instructions that we use, for example, in this type of online courses. So that students feel like, you know, they're not lost because there is that instructions. We can create like a recorded welcome video. So that's why the teaching presence can be elevated. So those are aspects that, you know, instruction, instructional designers should consider when building online courses. That's why we use this framework to help us design our design. Did you? So I want to introduce the research context. So this uh, design-based research was conducted in ADP 2030. Uh, the course title is Technological Application in Education, and I am the instructor in this course. Uh, so our first iteration was done in last spring semester, and our second iteration was done this semester, fall semester. And let me tell you about the delivery format. So in last spring semester, it was fully online course, so it was a mix of synchronous uh, synchronous uh, format and asynchronous format, and there were 15 <coughs> students in total. And this semester, the delivery format has changed, so now it is hybrid format. So for some week, I meet my student online, and for some week, I meet them in person. And now I have 19 students, and they are all pre-service teachers. <coughs> all right, this is the first iteration timeline. This is the first cycle of our design-based research. So we started in the spring 2022-2023 semester, like a last academic year. So we started our analysis and design on week seven to nine, and then we implemented that design on week 10 of the semester. And then we conducted our evaluations and reflections on week 11 and 12. So this is, the stages, these are the stages of the first cycle. So <clears throat> this is the cycle one. So this is the design and I would like to guide you through to the design that we have uh, built. So we built this lesson in Blackboard as our learning management system. And we broke down the lesson into three big um, categories, three big sections actually. The first one is the pre-activity, the second one is the main activity, and the third one is the post-activity. So in the pre-activity, I mean, before that, in each of the sections, we incorporated interactivity elements so that, you know, interactivity can be enhanced. For example, in the pre-activity, <clears throat> we used a Blackboard discussion board for them to share their thoughts about the topic of the week. So they can share their thought, they can interact with each other, they comment with each other through the discussion board on Blackboard. Another activity that we use to enhance interactivity is collaborative reading. So, you know, we not just put our reading there and let them read, no, but we use an app. The app is called Kami. So Kami reading app, that app allows collaborative reading. So students can get to the link that we have provided, go to the Kami app, and they will see the reading there. They can read the reading there, and they can post their thought there and comment to their peers' thought. So this, this app allows the interactivity within the reading, which is very cool, in my opinion. So they can learn from each other within the reading. And then the main activity, we provided a video 
about multimedia principles because that's the topic of the week. So not just watching video, but we use Edpuzzle. So Edpuzzle is a software that allow you know, us to enhance interactivity because in the video, the video is uh, created into some timestamps where there are, you know, several timestamps time stamp, time where they need to, you know, where it's paused, the video is paused, and then they will be presented with a question that they need to answer. So they need to pay attention to the video and they couldn't move forward because they need to finish answering question first and then they can move forward to the next part. So there is no move forward for them. And then the last one is the post activity in the cycle one. We ask them to uh, apply what they have learned about multimedia principle. So we wanted them to create uh, simple presentation materials that incorporated multimedia principles. And then we wanted them to do self reflection after that about the process of making that presentation. And then they also need to comment on each other presentations, each other work to, to enhance that uh, interactivity element. So that's the design. And then there is the implementation that I have talked about earlier is on week 10. And let's go to the evaluation part. So this is like the, the, the mo like more important part of the design-based research, like evaluations. How do they experience this type of um, learning? How do they experience asynchronous online learning? So we use Qualtrics as our, uh, as our way to get the survey response and we use open-ended questionnaires. So from that, we got like feedback, we got response from the students and we categorize that response into two big things. So it's under students' experience. The first one is their interactivity, what they think about their interactivity with their peers. And then the second one is what they think about their interactivity with the materials. So, as you can see in the dialogue box, <clears throat> that's like the four sub themes that we analyze, that we identify, I'm sorry, identified from the questionnaire uh, responses. So the yellow one is what we take into consideration for revisions. For example, the first one is time discrepancy. As I mentioned earlier that in the pre-activity, there was a collaborative reading, right? So some students, did the assignment very early, you know, comment their, give their comment very early in the collaborative reading. Some students gave their comment very close to the deadline. So there is that time discrepancy because one student who did early felt this advantage because they needed to wait until last minute to be able to respond to their peers' comment. So that time discrepancy is something that we took into our considerations for revisions. And then another one is clarity of instructions. You know, when we design courses, we thought, oh, it's pretty clear for us as the instructor. Apparently, that's not the case because some students <laughs> felt that it's so hard for them to find the assignment and it's so hard for them to understand what is expected to do. They said that the instruction is not that clear. So, all right. So we took that as our considerations and do better in the next phase. However, we also did a good job. Like for example, collaborative reading tool. Students really appreciate the ability, you know, to see their peers' response. So they can learn more from reading their peer response and from the interactions, which is a cool thing to do. And then another thing is the interactive video viewing, which is the ad puzzle. So they learn from watching the video and having to interact, you know, with the video and answering the question and answer and being provided with the feedback once they answer the question, let's say incorrectly, or like when they answer in question, the questions incorrectly, oh, there is a feedback from what we have provided. So that's that's something that they appreciate in this uh, cycle one. So we conducted the reflections from the cycle one. We took that as considerations for revisions, for first revisions that we made that will be explained further by my colleague Hyunju. We conducted two deadlines for the collaborative reading activity. One for original thoughts. The second deadline is for feedback. So we did that so that nobody feels disadvantaged. And then we want to improve instructions, clarity and organizations. We want to use more efficient language, not too wordy, for example. 
we want to use bolded font. Numbering, we want to provide details on the assignments and we want to restructure our instruction into a more logical order. So that's what we did. And then another thing that we did for revisions is we, you know, some students felt that the assignment is quite difficult for them to start from scratch. So we revised that. So they don't have to start from scratch when they design the material that, uh, you know, that where they can apply multimedia principle. However, we provided uh, already existing presentations with a poor design and they revised that with the multimedia principles. Like what can you, how can you make it better? It's like a problem solving kind of assignment. Now I'm going to walk you through the second iteration of our research. So the timeline is on week four and five, we met to revise our instruction design based on the feedback we got from the first cycle. And on week seven, we implemented the revised instruction design. And in the following two weeks, we met to evaluate their answers from the survey result and we reflected what did well and what we did well or what did not, not go well. <clears throat> so these are the, I'm gonna show you some examples of our revision. Sorry for the blurry screen. <laughs> so this is from first cycle and this is from second cycle. So they are basically talking about the same thing, but the way I deliver the message became different. I try to make it more clear, more readable, so students can get more clear, structured information about the lesson. This is also another example how we improve the information structure. So these two uh, uh, a screenshot says exactly the same thing. However, the way we structured the information became different. Instead of using bullet before bullet points, we used numbering and also bolded font, bolded font, and also we made a, a category, big category. Actually, we wanted to ask them to do two tasks, but from here, it was not really that clear what they are gonna do. But here they can see, oh, I'm gonna have to do two tasks. One, discussion forum, two, this interactive reading. And here in that task, I have to do two things, leave comments and responding to their comments. So it became more writable and more comprehensible. And another change we made, thank you, is we added new date for each task. Like she, uh, my, my friend Agam explained, we had a comment from my student, like they, there were a couple of students who were at disadvantage regarding to time. So we decided to put some deadline. So uh, it helped them, like nobody is in disadvantage, so they don't have to wait until uh, their classmates leave comment or not. And also by setting, so there are three duties, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. So it kept them to be more focused and it helped them to manage their time more uh, efficiently. And this is another revision we made. So uh, uh, the reason why we made this, reason, uh, this revision, uh, there were fairly low participation and a task completion rate in this post activity. So we thought, okay, then how can we increase the participation? How can we increase the task com completion? So we thought we can lower the difficulty, the challenges of the task. So instead of letting them create the teaching material from scratch, we, we provided poor presentation design and let them uh, to do problem solving task. So they had to revise the poor design uh, based on multimedia principles. And this uh, task was also very helpful regarding peer feedback because it's more fun. They all know they started from the same poor design. So it's when they take a look at each other's work, it's more, it, it makes more sense, right? Oh, you did this try and I, I made another design. So it's, uh, it's fun to compare each other's work. 
so we uh, so after we did the second iteration, we got the result. So we were very glad that we we could see. Oh, so we solved some problems from the first cycle. So um, so from the data we got, we found out that there is no more issues with interactive reading activity, which is Kami. And also we found out that the instruction we provided was very clear and it was organized, which was I was very glad. So these are the quotes, the evidence uh, from the survey results. So they said the checklist was very straightforward and it was helpful. And the checklist kept me focused and the organization was very helpful. So we did good job <laughs> in, that, in that sense. So oh, one sorry. more. Mm -hmm. And also, um, compared to the first cycle, there was increased participation and task completion rate. Everybody completed the posted activity in our second cycle. So we did a good job. So I also I want to introduce some interesting findings from our research. So uh, this is the one survey question they got. What specific elements or factors contribute to your engagement in the week seven asynchronous lesson? The first one is discussion forum. This is Kami, the interactive reading. And this is at Puzzle interactive video. This one is a uh, hands-on well, a problem solving task, and this is self assessment. This is peer feedback. Very interestingly, student chose at puzzle was the most like uh, element they make them to be engaged in their lesson. This was really interesting finding. Also, the pro problem solving uh, task and self assessment also contributed for them to be more engaged in their lesson. This is kind of unexpected result from our research. So we would like to dig in more. So uh, from the survey result, they said they there was quite good interaction with learning materials. Most of them chose this, there were significant interaction with the learning materials. However, they also mentioned that there was not as much interaction with peers which was very unexpected result because we tried our best to, to increase interactivity with peers in this instruction and design. So I, we wondered why there is this discrepancy. So we are planning to do, we are planning to, do, to conduct interviews to investigate this discrepancy in the following weeks. And for future instructional design, so from the second cycle, we can we cannot really say like our instructional design is perfect. So no more things improve. No, we still there's more thing to improve and make it better. So first one is there a couple of students mentioned like they they had difficulties in figuring out how to use certain technology, especially Kami. So for next iteration, we think we better provide like technological support in advance. Why don't we just teach them how to use Kami in advance and let them be more familiar to that technology? Then that, that will help them to be more engaged in their learning activities. And also another comment was uh, that one student said, spacing out the time we have to complete each assignment so we can have spend more time interacting with them. So there was three due dates, like Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. So uh, I, when I saw this answer, I, I was like, mm, yes, I can do this, right? I can space that I can give more time, give them more time to complete their tasks then they can have more time to think about their task and also they have more time to interact with others. So takeaways. So uh, after implementing these two cycles of research, we found out that uh, the incorporation of interactive tools enhance, can enhance interactivity <coughs> with learning materials. And also like I showed you the chart, like 
students thought that in interactive videos and hands-on problem-solving tasks and self-assessment can enhance learner engagement. All right, so the self-explanatory instructions are crucial. So we learned that as well. So when we design a synchronous online lesson, we need to pay attention on how we you know, create the instructions. So it needs to be self-explanatory, you know, like uh, pay, uh, structure well, organize well, use bolded, bolded fonts to, for, for highlighting important information. So we learn from the practice you know, as, as uh, instructors for this course and instructional designers, especially when they couldn't access the instructor because this is asynchronous online lesson. So self-explanatory instructions are very crucial. And then another takeaway that we learned is interactive learning activity help learners to better understand the context. And it was proven by the use of um, read, uh, collaborative reading app like Kami, and some students stated in the um, questionnaire response that they learn from each other from using that app. They see their friends or their uh, classmates' responses, and I learn from their responses. So that helped really help with the understanding and understanding of the content that we are teaching. And for example, the use of Edpuzzle really contribute as well in their understanding of the material. So. Interactive learning activity help learners to understand the material that we're teaching them to. So last but not least, we would like to talk about how library resources has been very beneficial and very useful for us. And I would like to thank Dr. Chris Bruder for helping us throughout this research project. One-on-one uh, -on -one consultation with you really you know, help us understand how to use academic resource very well and related to the topic of design-based research, multimedia principle and interactivity in online classes. And we learn about the bibliography management tools such as, such as Zotero. And we learn in the full potentials of university library website that, you know, help us uh, equipping us with the skill necessary to navigate through the website, find academic journals. That's very helpful and amazing. I thank you so much for that. We thank you so much for that. And then last but not least, the use of library study rooms, because that's where we met to discuss our ideas and the development of projects. So that's great. Thank you so much. And we would like to also thank Dr. Stricker, our advisor for uh, guiding us throughout this research project and, you know, don't get tired of guiding us and <laughs> we will bother you more and more. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, this is our references. And if you have any questions, we still have like around 15 to 20 minutes, I believe. I have personal questions or yeah. questions? Yeah. <laughs> So you use different technologies there, like the Cami. Um, tell us a little bit more about those. Are those free software, or there's a free software version of that? Or how did you? Right. How did students get access to that? Right. I think Yunju, you, you yeah. might be the right person to ask. So uh, most uh, features are free, but there is a paid version. But I don't think we are really necessary to buy that paid version because we we have no problem in using Yakami yeah, fully. So uh, I, mm, I first of all you should install this Kami extension and then you have to um, you open the article which is from your desktop and then you get the link. So if you share that link students can access to Kami without any login Mm -hmm. So there they can highlight uh, the sentences and they can make a like, text box to write their uh, <clears throat> comments and also they can record their audio. Yeah. So it is, I thought that instead of just letting them to write reading reflection individually, it would be more fun to see each other's comment while reading the reading article. So 
we actually got really great um, response about the Kami. So I will definitely implement using Kami for my future uh, lessons. Right. Thank you. I would like to add on that. The moment I know Kami was by working with Hyunju, because mm -hmm. I didn't know that there is that uh, amazing apps, because usually based on my experience as an instructor or being a student, you know, reading is just there. So I just need to read by myself and then interact with her in the class for a discussion in, in inside the class. But this app is amazing because it allows me to do the discussions while I was reading. Well, while I was reading, I can interact with someone. I can just post my question there and I can even use audio if I don't feel like writing. So I feel like it's a cool app to, to use in, in classes. So uh, thank you Hyunju, for introducing me to Kelly. <laughs> I started using Kami for like interactive reading from like 2021 at middle school. So I I tried my best not let my students get bored in class. <laughs> middle schoolers they need to have fun. So how can we make their reading more fun? Let them be more engaged. Let them be more interactive while reading process. So that's what we. <laughs> I and, and started incorporating Kami, and I think it is really good tool. Yes. So I have a question for you. First of all, thank you for this presentation. Um, when I'm thinking about the challenges that students face, especially in an online-only environment, did you also look at the possible uh, challenges? That you have, especially with tonal language. So, for as you well know, in Southeast Asia, we have a number of languages that are tonal in nature. Right. And sometimes students have trouble uh, hitting the right tones if they don't see someone's face. Right. Right. So that's a very great question. And our research. Um, is not focused on the language, but it's more like a data preparation course, but I can try to answer that question. So when we create an online lesson, we can incorporate like a multimedia tools that may be embedded within LMS or maybe outsource outside LMS. So we can provide, you know, tools that can help them listen to the tone of that language, you know. So we can still give examples of how the tonal language works through using, you know, the embedded apps within the LMS, like we have Blackboard, so we can use VoiceThread to do that, or we can outsource other app and connect it to our LMS. Like maybe um, the other app that can be used from outside the uh, outside Blackboard is like uh, Flipgrid, for example. So we can provide our example there in audio or video form and give examples of the tone. This is how you should pronounce it. You should, you should, this is how you should pronounce this word. So that is that, that uh, thing that we can do about that in asynchronous online lesson when we teach, let's say, tonal language in Southeast Asia. So yeah, that's why. The only other question is say, Pakam, why didn't you have that for me when I was studying Thai? <laughs> <laughs> when was that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the app was not yet do that. <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much. So partially a comment, yes. but also it's, uh, I'll try to make it into a question. So for the benefit of folks that aren't familiar with design-based research, one of the aspects of it, and you guys did a wonderful job, so it's just one little side thing, is there's a collaborative component. So instead of the lab being in, you know, the ivory tower, the lab or the, is, the experiment is done in the environment setting. So this was a class. So there's always a collaboration between researcher and teacher or researcher and professional or, or whoever it is you're working with. And we had the benefit of Agam as researcher, Anju as the teacher, but obviously she has the same skill set being in the same doctoral program. So I think I know that, you guys know that, but I think that part might have been left out just a little bit is that you have that collaborative aspect of where you're trying to assist the teacher in improving that. Or the same could be assisting a librarian, assisting uh, someone in another field. So there's always that collaborative aspect that helps make design based research where you're, you're working in the trenches or in the you know, the lab gets messy because it's the real world lab setting of the classroom or a conference room or a public space where you're teaching or learning. So there's one side thing. So that all said, I'm curious, 
both of you have education backgrounds. Both of you have taught before. And this is the hard part to put yourself in. If you didn't have that teaching background, do you think you would have tackled any of this differently? Would you have different ideas of how interaction works or what students might have needed? And it's a hard one if because you guys are both educators for a long time. Hmm. Uh, well, mm -hmm. So I think personally, like I have taught 10 years and more than 10 years in South Korea. I worked in middle and high school and elementary school as well. So I think with that like teaching experience, one thing I can do is observation. So I think I have like eyes to notice challenges from students. So I'm better at like noticing challenges students are facing and just instinctively try to make it better. So it was easier to come up with ideas how to face that those <clears throat> problems, but it was very helpful to have collaborators. Usually a teaching journey is like individual work. I teach, I design my lesson, I teach and I reflect my teaching. It is solo <laughs> playing, but with having my co-investigator, I could I could expand my thoughts and insights. So it was really good collaboration work. So it was really helpful to um, find more something beyond my thinking box. <clears throat> so I'll try to answer your questions with my best ability. <laughs> That's hard because I've been a teacher all my life since I finished my undergraduate degree. And being a teacher really shapes how I see interaction classroom. So like I have a what you might want to call high standard of interactive class. You know, I'm a snob of interaction, you know, in the classroom. Like I want my students to interact. Let's say if I don't have a background in education, I would still want my students to interact. I will still want them to have interactive element, but maybe not as high standard as what I have now becoming a teacher for like more than 10 years. So I feel like I still incorporate the element of interactivity, but not as complex as the, the, the definition of interaction that I have from becoming a 10 plus years of teaching, in with the 10 plus of the teaching experience. So does that answer your question? Maybe I, I will see well. what it's a very hard thing to do. Yeah. It would be interesting if you had a similar project with someone else in the room as edu an educator in another area mm -hmm. that you would bring the design side, but they would bring the expertise of their teaching in their right. area. So it might have a very different uh, different result of what the interaction looks like. Mm -hmm. so what interaction you were striving for in your class might be different from what someone else is striving for. Right. So it's just an interesting reflective point. Right. That's, I that's appreciate you point. engaging with me on that. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that well, that's a great question. So my experience really shaped the way I see and the way I think about interaction. Really. So especially I thought. Oh no. Especially I used to teach languages. So that kind of subject requires an interactive class. So yeah, that's that's how I got my understanding of interactions. But thank you for your question. Yes. Um, oh, so you notice that so as a student and this past semester I've actually been studying teachers' mental health when it comes to online learning. Because that's a topic I'm very passionate about. Overall do you guys, as educators yourself, do you critique, like, do you face your own struggles? Just like, not honestly with education, but just you guys as like a person. When it comes to online learning, are you guys completely opposed to this topic? And that you're trying to make the best of it? Or do you still think that it's a very, I think, beneficial way of learning? Because generally, I'm just curious, because I just like to see what teachers' perspectives on online learning are. You want to know teacher's perspective on online learning? Uh, yes, my mom's a teacher too, uh -huh. so I kind of got to see both sides when it came to the pandemic. Okay. And so my topic for my class, I'm still trying to see what teachers' viewpoints are. Mm -hmm. okay. That's a really good question. So before pandemic, I only taught face-to-face -face environment, but pandemic made me, force me to teach online. So at the beginning stage, I struggled a lot because students got so passive and they lost a lot of motivation in their <clears> learning. 
So it, it was really struggle for teachers. Of course, for us, we did not know how to conduct our lesson in a virtual world. It was everything was new. But besides that, it was hard to let them be engaged in lesson. So whenever we had a like teacher conference, every teacher just commonly they talked about, oh, well, we hate online lessons, <laughs> we hate online courses, we want to meet them in person. That's how we human beings live, right? We really miss the warm learning atmosphere. Like we feel like it is face-to-face -face learning environment is definitely more effective. But I see now it, the trend now is like we cannot really avoid it, online lesson, online course any more than what should we do as an educator. We should find how to increase the quality of the online lesson, online courses. That became our role to find the answer. So this kind of research is really beneficial for all the instructor and designer and also instructors. We have to keep finding how to uh, increase the standard uh, of, of increase the quality of the online lesson. It's gonna be our future, right? High flex courses. It will be like online, just the hybrid for me. We should accept diverse uh, delivery format, and we should be ready for different delivery formats. So we should find a way to increase the quality of each format. So I would like to try to respond to <coughs> your question as well. How do I see online learning, right? So I use, when I was still teaching Indonesia, before the pandemic, the use of my LMS, the use of LMS for me, just to upload grade and assignment. And then pandemic happened. The pandemic hit. So I had, you know, it, it forced me to do online learning, right? So I, I was struggling to, to cope with everything, learn everything in just overnight, basically. But that was a learning curve. And then I see that, oh, there is a potential of utilizing online learning, incorporating digital tools that can still help them interact to each other with the materials especially in that in that time for a language learning so okay it's a learning curve it's a learning curve it was not all good times not all like rainbow and what's that butterflies <laughs> <laughs> but you know i learned I, I i was forced at first i started to enjoy it i got to the point where i felt burnt out doing it and then i log it again so for me as a, as a teacher, I see that combination, a little bit of everything is what I would envision my ideal classroom would be if I have the freedom to create my own classrooms however I want. So maybe one time is in person. There are some times where what I think the best to be delivered asynchronous, then I would do it asynchronously. Maybe there are times where it's better to do it synchronously. That's my ideal situations of classroom. However, what I learned is that I need to communicate it well with my students that my class is like this, so you can, can you follow along, things like that. So clear communication is the key when I want to create that kind of type of learning. So yeah, now I feel the benefits of online learning. I, I love it as long as it's used like in a, in a good amount, in my opinion. If there is no emergency situations, I would like to I would like to still use it. I would like to use my ability that I earned from the pandemic in a in a right dosage, I would say, you know, combinations of a little bit of that. That's our ambition and how I see online. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Well, one more question. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. I have a question about I have a concern about um, Finding sustainable ways of creating effective instruction. So, in your um, research, you point out the technologies that you use that enhance interactivity, which are Kami, and I forgot the other one. Uh, and puzzle. Puzzle, yes. And <coughs> you mentioned that you just happened to know this technology because you were introduced to them in the middle school. So, I'm wondering how do you see instructors navigate the rapidly changing technological environment to keep 
better courses engaging and interacting. Right. What do you see as possible? Because right. if we're thinking about sustaining this type of interactivity, they have to stay up to date. Up to date, yes. Technology all the time. Yes. It doesn't mean that instructors have to go <coughs> and search for tools right before they you know, update their classes or what do you see this process? Right. Like? I can try to answer that question. So then you are right. You are 1,000% right that we need to stay up to date with, with technology tools. And at least I'm reflecting to my own experience as uh, instructional, technology, instructional technology student. I need to keep updated with what's new, what's useful, and using technology with, with purpose, not just for the sake of using technology, right? So the best for me the best way is talk to people collaborate like i learned from hyunju about this active this this coming app i didn't know back then but because i collaborated i share we share to each other i know well and then another thing is you know because i'm a scholar i'm a phd student read like read tech magazines like educational technology magazines or attend a conference where they did some showcase of technology. Like the last conference I attended in Portland, it was uh, NCLCA, uh, National College Learning Center Association. They have a showcase of technology on hotel ball. So I didn't know those type of technology, but I chose to go to the conference, emerge myself in that atmosphere. I become knowledge, more knowledgeable about what's new out there. So the highlight is, we got to be proactive because, you know, it, it changes within minutes, I would like to say. So, yeah, like the proactivity is the key, I would say. So, is that a question? Yeah, but I hope I wasn't clear enough in my, the essence of my question. Oh, sure, sorry. It's feasible for instructors to research very niche type of technology for their courses. Yeah, because they would have to do that very often. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's feasible? Like, do you see this as a sustainable model? Right, right. Well, for me, it goes back to what kind of instructor do you want to be? Like, I like to see the use of technology. I like to gain the benefit of it. So whether it's sustainable or not, it goes back, goes back to you because it's not always applicable to everyone, but the general key is using technology, not for the sake of technology. You know, using technology to achieve, to make it easier and more efficient to achieve the goal. So that's what should be highlighted here. So it's sustainable or not, it come back, you know, to the instructor, but the highlighted point is using technology to, uh, to make it more efficient to achieve the goal. So if using technology just make it more complicated for you, then don't use it. If you think that you can achieve your goal without using technology, you know, you don't have to use it. But the key is, if it makes the teaching more efficient, then go for it. So that's how I see it. Thank you. My offer just one. Yeah. Nelly, right? Yes. Okay, I thought so. The joy of having someone who's in an online class with you, but you don't <laughs> see them very often, so you're always pretty sure. Um, that's also a good advantage of having your professional networks, so you have people that are actively sharing with you. But another thing that often happens is just collaboration, like being able to talk to someone else. But um, in the college environment, the, the universities invest in certain technologies. So you can choose if you want to go one beyond what they're doing. Is there something unique that you can't solve with the provided technologies? And so then you decide, is it beneficial to you? In this instance, it was one lesson. So it was a minimal investment to address one time that wasn't available. Now, if you were having to do every single lesson every single year, probably that's not terribly sustainable. So you kind of have to pick and choose when you want to invest your time and energy and what resources go beyond what's being offered in a K-12 setting or a college setting. So I think that's the balance you have to strive for. And what I found was like, getting at was, where's that balance and what is that energy? Uh, do you really need it? Because sometimes we have instruction that doesn't benefit from technology. It just makes it glossier, yep. cooler, whatever else, but it doesn't aid the transmission it doesn't make it more beneficial so it's just kind of that weird balancing act but usually if you have at least one professional community where you have peers where you can exchange ideas 
I often go online and say, I'm thinking about this, what is your experience? And I have 20 or 30 people to share with me. So it's a great minimal effort for me to sustain mm -hmm. exploring one new option. Mm -hmm. so this Sorry, I didn't mean to call no, it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I think it's time to end this presentation. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending the presentation. Good presentation. Uh, uh, being here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Can you advance back to your first slide? I'd like to go through sure you guys your, oh. your title slide. Oh, yeah. Your, on it? yeah your very first slide. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you.